Good evening. Um, my name is Monica Elliott. I'm currently president of the League of Women Voters here in Broward County. And this is our general meeting, the second Wednesday of the month. That's when we try to do them. Doesn't always work out that way, but that's when we try uh, to do them. But I also want to mention that there is another meeting on April 26th that's dealing with public health and climate change. And that is going to be an in-person meeting at the West Regional Library that starts at 6, 6 p.m., Stephanie? Yeah, 6 p.m. And uh, Dr. Julie uh, Long, who's a league member, and Georgia Kaskaski, I think, um, are going to be speaking about uh, that topic, public health and climate change. So we're, we're trying to do a mix up of both Zoom meetings and in-person in person meetings, because uh, we're sort of getting out of the COVID environment. So tonight I am going to be doing the presentation and it's the women behind Everglades National Park. And so I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen with you. Let's see, I just realized something I was gonna do first was make sure if everybody will just make sure that they are muted before we uh, begin. And if somebody can give me a thumbs up that they can see my screen. Or if somebody will speak up and let me know they can see the screen. Perfect. Can you okay, great. Okay, so again, this is the women behind Everglades National um, Park. And I've kind uh -huh. of got in, into this topic um, because you're going to see how it intersects with the suffragists of that time. So Everglades National Park celebrated its 75th anniversary in 2022. But part of this park was preserved 31 years before then, when it was, before it was dedicated. And furthermore, it was maintained during that 31 years by a group of women, not men, it was a group of women. And this was the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. So to a certain extent, this is their um, story. So before we had Everglades National Park, there was Royal Palm State Park. And one would assume that because it's called a state park, it was managed by the state. And you're soon going to see that that was not the case. But even before there was Royal Palm State Park, there was a place called Paradise Key. And so that's really where we're going to begin. But the first thing we're going to do is talk about the men that are involved with the Everglades. So to tell the story, we have to talk about the men and the land that at the end of the 1890s and early 1900s. One thing to remember is that in the early 1900s, the population of Florida was under 1 million people. The population lived primarily in rural areas and the towns were still quite small. For example, in 1910, the state population was just barely 750,000 people. And the town of Fort Lauderdale had 143 white residents. And this is another important aspect of the story at the turn of the century. Blacks and indigenous populations, they're not part of the story as their voices were suppressed. So two of the men that we um, involved with draining the swamp were Governor William Sherman Jennings and Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Brower. It's said that Governor Jennings was elected the governor of Florida on the promise to expand the role of the state government to help the poor, to develop more sc schools, and thirdly, to drain the Everglades. And that's exactly what he proceeded uh, to do. It was part of a land reform effort. So Governor Brower continues with the effort that Governor Jennings um, started. And it's Governor Brower who brings President Teddy Roosevelt down to the glades for a trip through the drainage areas. And Roosevelt becomes an avid supporter of drainage and became an important advocate for the program. 
So a couple of other men involved with this, of course, are Henry Flagler and James Ingram. So we all know about Henry Flagler and what he was doing down here. And while Flagler is important to the story, so is James Ingram. He started as a railroad engineer and he moved his way up in management positions with the various um, railroad company. He was eventually hired by Flagler to manage the building of the overseas uh, railroad. Now we're gonna talk about the land. But first we're going to talk about who manages the land and it's the Internal Improvement Trust Fund. So Florida becomes a state in 1845 and Congress five years later passes what's called the Swamp and Overflowed Lands Act, kind of um, apropos for today, um, but it's primarily to deal with the development of Florida's Everglades and it transfers some 20 million acres of land in the Everglades to the state of Florida. Five years later, the Florida legislature creates the Internal Improvement Trust Fund. And this is the agency that's going to manage the acreage. And it still exists today. The current board of trustees of the Internal Improvement Trust Fund is the governor and the cabinet. It's the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's Division of State Lands that serves as the staff to the Board of Trustees. And currently the Division of State Lands you know, manages about 12 million plus acres and the Florida Forever Program is under their um, jurisdiction. So a agency that was established in 1855 is still very much in existence. So just to get an idea, I think probably most people have been to Everglades National Park, but just to illustrate that it is there at the tip of the state. Paradise Key is outlined in red. It's just kind of, it's not really showing any outline of an area, but this is where it would have been in relationship to where the current Royal Palm Visitor Center is located. And it was described in the late 1800s as a hammock having almost 1,000 Royal Palms. So Paradise Key itself, James Ingram, who again is one of the people involved in our story, he makes a track across the Everglades from Sarasota on behalf of Henry Plant. And he's the other railroad tycoon that lives in Tampa. And if you've ever seen the University of Tampa campus, uh, their big administrative building was one of his um, hotels. But Ingram starts out working for Plant. At some point after this track, Flagler hires Ingram. And then we have a, uh, Dr. Rolfs and Dr. Britton uh, who make a trip to Bar Paradise Key. And after they see what's there, they approach Ingram to ask Flagler if he would grant the land to have a, pre a preserved area. But the problem at this point in time is that Flagler doesn't own the land. It's not until three years later that Flagler actually acquires a portion of Paradise Key. And this is via a quick claim deed from the state of Florida. So what I'm showing here on the map is um, kind of your outline of the park, the square, the rectangle there with the circle in the middle, that is Royal Palm Park. And what is called the Old Ingram Highway. This is one of the routes that Henry Flagler's railroad considered when they were trying to decide on their overseas um, highway. And Old Ingram Highway actually goes down all the way to Cape Sable, or at least it did at one point. Um, there in brown, we're showing the current Palm, Royal Palm Visitor Center, and then those trails in brown, again, are part of that old Ingram Highway. But this gives you an idea of where Royal Palm Park was in relationship to what we see, or is in relationship to what we have down there now. So now we're going to talk about the women. And I think the most important thing you need to remember is that Everglades National Park is the only national park that was initially begun 
by a woman's organization. And that organization was the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. And I'm just going to give you a brief history about them here in Florida. So in 1883, there uh, was formed by 18 women's groups, the Village Improvement Association of Green, Green Cove Springs. And again, you have to remember that most of the population in Florida it was either in the northern third of the state or they were all down in Key West. You know, Miami and Fort Lauderdale, I mean, they were in the middle of nowhere. But in 1891, we do get the Housekeepers Club of Coconut Grove being formed. 1895 is when the Florida Federation of Women Clubs is formed. And essentially, it's kind of like with the league, where we have all of our local leagues, and then there's the state league, and then there's the national league. Well, here they have their individual women's clubs, um, and then they have the Florida Federation, and then the general federation. And it's actually not until 1911 that we get the Fort Lauderdale Women's Club being formed. So the Housekeepers Club becomes a women's club of Coconut Grove. And the picture I'm showing you here is their first building in Coconut Grove. Well, two of the women involved with that are Mary Barr Monroe, and she happens to be a longtime friend of um, James Ingram. And she's also very passionate against the use of the egret in heron plumes for women hats. And she writes a great deal about that. She was married to the author Kirk Monroe. Then there's also Edith Gifford, and she is the wife of John Gifford, who has uh, obtained one of the first uh, PhDs in forestry. They moved down here in 1902. So the 10th annual meeting of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs was held in Coconut Grove in 1905. Mary Barr Monroe and Ethan Gifford put forth two proposals at that time. One, they want the governor to appoint a forestry commission. And second, they want the Federation to endorse their proposal to make a federal forest reservation of Paradise Key in the Everglades. And the reason is to preserve the unique group of royal palms, because it's the only spot in the United States where these palms are found um, growing naturally. Now, this proposal gets ignored by the Florida legislature, but part of the reason it gets ignored is because it's still not real clear who all owns the land that they're trying to preserve. So the next woman in this story is May Mann Jarnings, and she is very, very politically astute. Uh, when her father is in the Florida legislature, she actually acts as his legislative aide. Well, she catches the eye of Judge William Sherman Jennings, and uh, they are married in 1891, and they are actually married in the Florida State Capitol building, you know, that little building that's in front of the real tall building that's now our state capitol. And that's where they were married. And according to the information I find, they were escorted down the aisle by the full legislative membership. I mean, this was truly a politically astute couple. Eventually, she becomes the first lady of Florida when uh, Jennings becomes the governor in 1901. She just doesn't sit still. She's always an advocate. Uh, she moves to Jackson, they moved to Jacksonville in 1905. And as soon as she gets there, she joins the Jacksonville Women's Club. And by 1914, she's president of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. But she also happens to be a friend of Mary Monroe and Ethan Gifford, and probably through the women's clubs organizations. And I also want you to know, kind of coming back to the league, is she helped start the first League of Women Voters here in Florida. Um, that's not exactly what they call it at that time, and it doesn't last very long but she does try to start an organization in Florida after 1920. Then we have another lady and that's Mary Lily Keenan Flagler. She's the third wife of Henry Flagler. I think we all know the story. You know, she was 34 and he was 72 when they get married. 1912, Henry Flagler has finished his railroad and a year later he dies and she inherits everything or almost everything. 
Well, Mary Flagler is willing to donate 960 acres to the Federation of Florida Women's Club for the park that they would like to have. Mary Flagler tells James Ingram, who tells Mary Barr, who then tells Mae Jennings. And so that's how it all gets started. All these people kind of know each other in one way or the other. Because again, it's a very small population of people. So that is kind of the beginning of Royal Palm State Park. Now, Mae Jennings, again, she's very politically astute. She's married to an ex-governor. She believes the state will give the Florida Federation of Women's Club an equal amount of Paradise Key land to combine with Mary Flagler's donation for a park if the state doesn't have to maintain it. And this is where she puts the old girl network into play to see, to kind of test the waters in Tallahassee. So she finagles a stay at the governor's mansion. And keep in mind, this would be her old home and stays with governor and Mrs. Park Trammell, who of course is a Florida Federation of Women's Club member. You know, again, they're all kind of belong to the same organization. So December 24th, 1914, the trustees, this is the, um, the land trustee group, they do grant the uh, women's club request for the 960 acres of the hammock land, but the legislature does have to approve it. Now at this time in our history, the legislature only meets every two years and they do happen to be meeting in spring of 1915. And ex-Governor Jennings does help draft the bill to transfer the land. And he also includes $1,000 for maintenance. Well, essentially on the very last minute of the last day of the legislature, they do pass the bill, but without the maintenance money. And the opposition thought this would doom park development. Doesn't phase May Jennings at all. And the Women's Club, they go to work fundraising and it's called the Mile of Dimes campaign. What they do is they get cardboard folders that are one foot in length with slots for 12 dimes. And the idea is that if the folders are laid end to end for one mile, they would have $6,000. Sounds like a good idea. They only raised about $1,000, but that didn't stop them. And they were able to obtain another $1,200 from the Dade County Commission to get their project going. And this is where another lady that we all know comes into, into play. And that's Ivy Cromarty Stranahan, who's considered the mother of Fort Lauderdale. And she's also involved in the Fort Lauderdale uh, Women's Club. She's actually their president from 1913 to 1915. And we know that her job in 1915 and probably later is that she monitors the situation at the Royal Palm State Park. She drives down to the state park once a month from Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is probably, this is just a picture of a Model T in that area era. That's probably what she was driving. But this is what the roads look like. The old Ingram Highway isn't completed in terms it isn't paved, improved until at least November, 1916. So she's having to drive on these horrible roads to get down there. Now, one of the things that the uh, Women's Club do is they do hire a caretaker in March, 1915. And this is Charles Moisier. He had worked at Viscaya, uh, for Deerfield, and he had explored, uh, explored Paradise Key with David Fairchild, so he was familiar with the area. And he and his family lived in the tent until the lodge was built. So we do have the dedication of Royal Palm State Park on November 23rd, 1916. This is the official dedication. According to the story, at least 168 cars drove to the park for the dedication. They drove in a caravan from a hotel in downtown Miami to the park. Uh, Sam, Samuel Belcher, who is the man in the central uh, picture, he was chairman of the Dade County Commission and he dedicated the Royal Palm State Park as well as the Ingram Highway that was done at that day. 
Uh, the arrow, the red arrow in the center picture is pointing to May Mann Jennings, who was president of the Florida Federation of Women's Club at that time. And then the other uh, lady on the stage was Mary Kay Sherman, who was essentially the national president. She was president of the General Federation of Women's Club. And she would have come all the way down to Miami for this event. After the dedication ceremony, of course, the women had a picnic lunch and they served a lunch to about a thousand attendees. The menu was turkey, beans, salad, coffee, and donuts. So using uh, funds that they were able to get any way they could, they finally completed the lodge in August, 1917. And this is where the caretaker and his family lived. And it served as both the lodge and the restaurant for the family and for park visitors, uh, especially scientists, because there was just so much um, that had to be learned about this particular Paradise Key and this particular um, area. And this is a photo um, taken about one month after the lodge was completed in September 1917. Uh, the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs has one of their meetings at the new lodge. Uh, the lady with her face circled, it, that is Ivy Stranahan, and the red arrow is pointing at May Man um, Jennings. Now, I want to pause for just a minute and talk about what else is happening in Florida at this time, because it's going to bring in a couple other women who are involved here. So Mary Jennings Bryan who is the wife of William Jennings Bryan. This is the man who tried to be um, president at least three times. They started to build a home in Miami in 1912. And of course she belongs to the Federation, uh, to the Women's Club. And she and her husband are both very strong advocates for women's suffrage. In 1915 is when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas moves to Miami. Uh, she initially starts out working for her father, who is the first publisher of what will become the Miami Herald. But she also is a suffrage activist and later an Everglades activist. There's also the formation of the Florida Equal Suffrage Association, which was formed in 1913. So when May Jennings is president of the Women's Club in 1915, that is when the Women's Club, they officially endorsed women's suffrage. They had not done that before. And they allow these local Florida Equal Suffrage Associations, um, those leagues to join the Women's Clubs. Now, it just also happens that Ivy Stranahan is president of the uh, Florida Equal Suffrage Association in 1917 and 1918. So what you actually have is that the Equal Suffrage Association and the Federation of Women's Club, the leadership of both those organizations is virtually the same. And they are very actively lobbying the Florida legislature and Congress in 1917 and 1919 to get the women's suffrage. And as a matter of fact, we know that Mary Bryan May Jennings, Ivy Stranahan, and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, they lobbied the Florida legislature in 1917 for two bills uh, regarding equal suffrage. Uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote about her experience during, in, in 1917. She said, all four of us spoke to a joint committee wearing our best hats. Talking to them was like talking in graven images. They never paid any attention to us at all. And we also know that Mary Bryan, she actually speaks before a joint session of the legislature. And if I remember correctly, I think it was the first time a woman had done that. Um, but of course, they still ignore her. But it just points out that these women are always doing double duty. So here they are, they're lobbying the state legislature for women's right to vote. At the same time, they're trying to get money to sustain the Royal Palm State Park. And that was the problem. So the park was reality and how are they going to sustain it? And uh, this just shows you the uh, one, the center photo is a picture of what the inside of the lodge looked like. Uh, you see a photo of what the outside of the lodge looked like. And you could actually stay there 
And you could actually make um, dinner reservations and they indicate you would have to make them by mail or wire. Um, I think is like you know, a certain time in the morning. But we do know that they are having problems because think about what else is going on during this time. The park is heavily damaged in the 1926 hurricane. And then we also know that there's some major fires in the park which damage the hardwoods. Then the stock, mar stock market crashes in October 1929, and you've got bank failures. And it's in this letter of June 14th, 1930, that May Jennings sends an SOS out to the women's clubs. The Bank of Bay Biscayne of Miami and three affiliated banks failed to open Wednesday morning, the 11th. All of the funds belonging to the Federation, except the principal, the endowment fund, have been lost. So they've lost a lot of, a lot of money, but fortunately they haven't lost the endowment fund. But she goes on to say, our investment in Royal Palm State Park is too great to leave unguarded. The whole premises will be looted if left even for a week. We also learned some other information from this letter. Um, one, the state had appropriated $10,000 for uh, rehabilitation work after the hurricane and the fire. And they had received some of that money. They were probably going to receive a certain amount over a certain number of years. But after the stock market crash of 1929, suddenly the payments stop. They are getting money because they are renting the so-called tomato land. And then another thing I find interesting is they're actually selling some of the palms. Now, it just says sale of palms, but I'm assuming that they mean the royal palms. So they're not getting that much income from, from the sale of the palm trees nor are they getting that much money uh, via the lodge in terms of people coming to stay, having dinner, et cetera. But we know further from this letter that the women's club, local women uh, members of, of the women's club park committee, they continue to travel to Royal Palm State Park each month for a committee meeting. And they're doing this at their own expense. Again, they're looking after things and making sure it's all under control. We also learned from this letter, I mean, this is like a four page letter. It's just, just, uh, it just gives you all sorts of information that the Women's Club has offered Royal Palm State Park to the US National Park Service um, to serve as the beginning of the Tropic Everglades National Park. That's what they were going to call it. And then this is going to bring us to the last woman in our story. And that is Ruth Bryan Owens. She is the daughter of Mary and William Jennings. Of course, she's going to be president of the Miami Women's Club at some point in time. But she also serves two terms in Congress uh, beginning in 1929. And in fact, she is the first woman elected in the southeastern part of the state, uh, southeastern part of the country to serve in Congress. She's one of the first women to do this after women obtain the right to vote. And she's serving the fourth um, district of Florida. And this encompasses the entire East Coast. And I mean from Key West to Jacksonville. And supposedly she campaigned in this green Ford coupe, coupe dubbed the spirit of Florida. And this is just a picture I happen to find of one. But again, everything is interrelated. Her campaign manager was not a man. It was May Man Jennings. Of course, this always seems to be there. At the same time that they're starting to really go after getting this national park going um, in the Everglades, there is a group, that, uh, for additional groups that form to advocate for it. And it's the Tropic Everglades Park Association. The first president is David Fairchild with Ernest Coe as the executive secretary. And if you've ever been to on the park, you will know that the uh, visitor center is named for Ernest Coe because he was very instrumental um, in development of the park. Also, as part of this association are Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and again, May Man Jennings. I mean, this woman is everywhere. U.S. Senator Fletcher, and U.S. Representative Ruth Bryan Owen 
they introduced a bill in 1929 that's written by Ernest Coe to create Everglades National Park. What happens next is that the delegation uh, visits a proposed park area um, in February 1930. This is like a congressional delegation, includes scientists, et cetera. So the picture on the left side is Representative Ruth Bryan Owen during this visit. In the middle is a picture of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas during the, a boat trip. Now, I'm pretty sure this is during the same visit, although the photo I found simply stated it was taken in 1930. But then they also viewed the area that they were talking about making into park uh, with a blimp. And this was the Mayflower, which at that time was based in St. Pete. Now, Ernest Coe, um, evidently, according to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he was sick the entire time the blimp was in the air. She stayed beside him while he vomited into a bucket. But finally, they get an official act to provide for the establishment of the Everglades. And this is May 30th, 1934. It's to be a park of over 2 million acres and it's to be acquired through public or private donation but there's to be no money spent on the site for the last five years. Because again, we're still dealing with the effects of the depression. But one of the really important things about the establishment of Everglades National Park is that they wanted to keep it as a wilderness with no development. So as to be a wilderness where no development or plan for entertainment of visitors shall be undertaken, which will interfere with the preservation of the unique flora and fauna of the essential primitive natural conditions now prevailing in the area. This mandate to preserve the wilderness is one of the strongest in the legislative history of the national park system. Now, not everybody was happy about this. And Congressman Owen, she's very staunchly defending the Everglades National Park Project. And this doesn't make all of her constituents uh, happy back here in South Florida. Owen's long-term friend is Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and she recalls a particularly dramatic debate on Capitol Hill, where Florida farm landowners, uh, they attended to voice their, their um, strong opposition. They argued that selling their property to the government was senseless because the Everglades was merely a worthless swamp filled with snakes and mosquitoes. The constituents even brought along a live snake to make their point. Congressman Owen, determined not to lose the argument to such lowly prank, grabbed the snake, wrapped it around her neck, and announced, that's how afraid we are of snakes in the Everglades. But at least they did get the park. But it's the Women's Club who continues to manage the state park. Because 10 years later in 1944, there is still no Everglades National Park. It's not until that year that they finally get Congress to authorize establishment of a national wildlife refuge, at least to have some way to protect the land. And then two years later, we get the Florida legislature providing um, $2 million to purchase private lands in the Everglades. And it turns out that May uh, Man Jennings and the governor, uh, they own land that's near what we would, Flamingo, and they donate that land to the project. And then the Women's Club donates Royal Palm State Park land to federal government. And December 6, 1947 is when President Truman de um, dedicates Everglades National Park. This is the uh, kind of the official ceremony where um, the Women's Club turns the land over to the, to the national, to the federal government. And the man in the picture is Daniel Beard. And this plaque, which was established on October 10th, 1947, it is still there. Before the park is dedicated, exactly one month before the National Park is dedicated, is when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's book, The Everglades River Grass, is published. 
Now, she had been asked to write a book about the Miami River because it's going to be part of the Rivers of America series. And she declared when she started looking, you know, about writing about the Miami River that it was boring and it was only one inch long. A little bit of an exaggeration. But it did get her interested in the Everglades. And she spent five years researching the Everglades before she published this book. And it's in this book that she convinces everyone that the, the Everglades is a flowing river. It's not just a swamp. You know, that river is flowing down from central Florida all the way down um, to um, the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. And she's also the first one that brings attention to the fact that we've got degradation of the Everglades already occurring. So this is one month, I mean, it couldn't have been more timely, one month before the park is dedicated. And finally, it's dedicated on December 6, 1947. And uh, President Truman is there, just to name some of the other people that you may be familiar with. Um, Admiral Lee is uh, in the far left side. Then you've got President Truman. Uh, the man that's kind of covered up by the mic microphones was Secretary of the Interior on uh, crew. Uh, Senator Claude Pepper, if you all remember him. And then the lady in the hat, that is Mae Jennings. So the Florida Times Union, this is what they say on the day of the dedication that the Everglades National Park is a permanent monument to the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. For to this energetic organization must go most of the credit for the long and much of the time struggle that resulted in setting aside that portion of the Everglades area that now becomes Everglades National Park. And think about it, it's a group of women. I mean, yes, it's mostly wealthy white women but it's still women in an era when women were just coming into their own and started vocalizing and ad advocating for their causes. And it's they who worked to obtain the land for a park, they developed the park so people can visit it, and then they maintain it for over 31 years. So you have to thank the Florida Federation of Women's Club for preserving environment that truly exists nowhere else on earth. Who knows what would have happened if they hadn't been so dedicated. These are some of the sources um, that I used for the information um, I just spoke about and where some of the pictures um, came from. I'm going to stop sharing and if I can answer your questions, I will try to. Uh, it was really interesting to learn about what these women had done. So, Bonnie. So, where is Parad what is at Paradise Key now? What happened to all these royal palms? I, I, I'm. It's it's a somewhat of a mystery, isn't it? I, I think so. Um, uh, that's one thing that I would really like to know. If there was truly yeah. thousands of royal palms, um, they do talk about you know massive fires that occurred. It sounds like it occurred after the hurricane of 1926. Oh. But in my experience, because that's what I am as a palm expert, right? Um, palms aren't usually destroyed by fire. I mean, it would take a lot to actually destroy a, a, ro a royal palm. I think. So whether they were eventually sold off, because I, I was really surprised to find out that the ladies were selling the royal palms, which they're actually trying to preserve. But yeah. if they're trying to get money, that maybe that's one way to do it. But no, I, I think that is the great mystery of all times. Well, I sent you a picture of like the one remaining structure that is, and you said it's somewhere down the Ingram Highway it's not, the, the park does nothing to show people where this is now. You know, it's not near where the current, if you go to the current Royal Palm Plaza, where there are no Royal Palms or very few. Um, and they're planted. But, and they're planted. Yeah, There's those a are sign there natural. that credits the women's club. But, and I always thought this was where it all happened, that this was where the the original parcel was, but it's, it's, it's some distance away, huh? It, it, 
evidently, I, I, I'm not, it's, I haven't ever found a map that outlines exactly what is Paradise yeah. Key. Yeah. So that's one thing. And it could very well be that the hammock uh, that existed over 100 years ago, you know, has been, was well, inundated by water. You know, it's really hard to know exactly, you know, what happened. But no, I don't, I'd like to find a map of what Paradise Key is. I found a map that showed where Royal Palm State Park was at. And right. we and we know that that was part of Paradise Key. Right. So. Because the current Royal Palm Plaza, like Ro Royal Palm area at Everglades National Park, you know, there's this, there's this um, canal and they say that the canal is part was part of the road that went through there and they dug the canal in order to build the road and that's where the path is you walk down now uh, it, 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 so anyway uh, it's <laughs> the geography the geography of these various things in the everglades is very mis is very mis i'd love to know it's very mysterious and i'm very interested right right um carrie thank you um i i grew up in florida uh, since 1957, um, uh, my wow. family came down um, and and they owned a small bowling uh, alley with um, the Bavarian Inn restaurant with my German grandmother running it. Anyway, we brought seniors um, to these bowling tournaments all over the state. And my father also played soccer on the side to supplement the income. But I remember as a child, um, very clearly that the Royal Palms in um, Fort Myers area were just extraordinary. Hmm. And it's like, how yeah, did they get yeah. all these Royal Palms all lined up on all the roads? Hmm. And, and I'm just curious, do we know where those palms came from? Because there was like, mm -hmm. I'm saying as a child, you know, they mm -hmm. were just everywhere on every road. Right. So, so do we know that history of where those palms came from? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Th those were planted. They're not natural. Yes. I do know no, that. No, they're all lined up. <laughs> right, <laughs> they right. They were totally not natural. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so no, I, I don't know. But I mean, raw palms grow very quickly. Yes. So, um, you know, within 20, 30 years, you, you would have a good size palm. But so, but as palms get older, you know, they slow down tremendously. And I guess that's one thing we don't know is how long does a royal palm uh, live to be? Because it's palms are unlike hardwood trees. They don't have rings that you can count to determine how old they are. You have to know exactly when a palm was planted in order to determine its age. But we do know that, uh, you know, date palms can live for hundreds of years. And whether that's true for royal palms or not, I, I don't know. I mean, we do know that some palms are very short lived, but I don't know that for royal palms. Because yeah. Ed Edison, well, like, you know, with yeah. Edison's uh, involvement, I just would love to know that history. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as one of these things, I think I do know the story, but I can't think, I, I don't remember now what that story is. I'll have to see if I can find that in some notes. Um, Joan. The, the history was fascinating. And thank you, Monica, because today the Everglades and the Everglades National Park is not just a Florida treasure. It's been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the home of seven different ecosystems. It's the only place on earth where saltwater crocodiles and freshwater alligators live in the same sort of area and 43 different breeds of mosquitoes <laughs> <laughs> that i believe that so i believe. take a lot of spray when you go down there but it is fascinating and um i'm not surprised that it took a bunch of women to make it happen so thank you so much for that history well, what's impressive yeah, is that it wasn't just them lobbying or or, or taking up the cause was how hands-on it was, how they went there 
when travel was so difficult and you think of like, oh, the little ladies, oh, we can't go, any, they can't go alone. They're they're going into this wilderness, you know? It, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, and did they, did, did, did they go alone? But I, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I think from what I've heard from Ivy Stranahan from the Fort Lauderdale Women's Club, um, it, you know, she would have probably gone with another woman, uh -huh. but it certainly wasn't, you know, Frank didn't go with her. You right. know, he was too right. busy running the store and post office and everything. Right. So probably her friend, Annie Beck, you know, with, went with her. Um, so yeah, I mean, I know it, it's in a time- And they built the lodge. Is, the women didn't build that lodge. No, no, mm -hmm. no, they hired that out, mm -hmm. but they obviously did not trust the men who were doing the work <laughs> because that was kind of their job was to make sure they were getting their money's worth for everything that was happening down there. And, um, and it did, there is, I didn't mention this, but it did cause some controversy within the women's club, um, the Federate, Florida Federation, because they borrowed against some of their assets uh, to keep the Royal Palm State Park going. So from on a statewide view, there was probably some women, you know, in the northern central part of the state is like, you know, why are we spending of our all of our money just in this one little area? Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, May Man Jennings, I mean, she had, she was just a force unto herself. I mean, she had her finger in everything in this state. And she is considered, she's called, you know, the mother of forestry. Um, she, she got that put through. I mean, so the Jennings and the Bryans are there's they were there there's a marriage that joined that where the, where these two different these two different families are joined in a marriage um and, they're, and there's they're multiple cousins. yeah they they are related um William yeah William Brian and uh Governor Jennings were cousins okay so yes, there was some relationship there with that. But like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, you know, she she was just the new kid on the block, but she was, you know, the young woman who mm -hmm. seemed to get involved with everything, you know, too. So she's kind of I mean, late. I mean, for someone who was the mother of the Everglades, she was kind of late to the movement, actually. Yes. And probably, and you kind of get the feeling that. It was this, this request to write the book that, you know, she'd always kind of been a naturalist, but she hadn't really paid that much attention to the Everglades until she started writing this book hmm. is, is kind of the implication um, that they make. So interesting, but, but it's the timeliness of her book is what's uh, really amazing. And she had to have known, you know, all this was happening and, you know, was she furiously, writing and trying to get it published in time to coincide with the dedication of the park because you know that had to help the book sales right and uh um, then it also just brought it to the national attention of everyone too by having this book out but so it, it's all there's coincidences but it's just a matter that everybody of that class i mean because again it would have been they weren't you know, super wealthy, but they were certainly women of means, um, you know, who probably knew each other. And again, they would have all belonged to the women's clubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the forerunner that we never had a huge suffrage uh, groups in Florida like they did in other states. The closest we ever got was with the Florida uh, Equal Suffrage Association. And really it was the women's club. It was really just a part of the women's club. So Monica, were there any um, Miccosukee or any indigenous people living in that area? I, I'm sure, I'm sure there were, I'm sure. Although at some point in time there would have been, but when they would have started working on developing the park, that, that would be after the um, indigenous people were rounded up and taken to the reservations. 
Okay. Do you remember that was happening? Because that mm -hmm. was one of the things that Ivy Stranahan did also on behalf of the Women's Club was helping with the Miccosukee and with the Seminole in moving them to uh, the new reservation in Dania. She was the one that you know, helped to convince them that it was in their best interest to move to the reservation. But she, there was actually a, a committee in the women's club just for dealing with the indigenous people. And then we know that, you know, she, she did a lot, you know, with the Seminole Indians too. So it's, it's, not, it's not a nice history when it comes to the indigenous people. There's no doubt about that. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you um, very thank much. You, thank you. Stop the recording.